we have Jia Yuan Wang from George Washington University, and she'll be talking to us about the herbicide actions in complex reflex treatment groups. Go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Today I'll talk about, yeah, you already know what I'm gonna talk about, and this is joint work with my advisor, Joe Lewis. First, let's talk about what is a herbicide action. Let G be a group, and we build a tuple using elements in the group G. Consider the following operation, sigma I, where we focus on TI and TI plus one. So we slide TI plus one to the previous position and conjugate TI by TI plus one and slide that into the later position. This is called a single herbicide move. And this is invertible. So in sigma i, we conjugate Ti, but in the inverse, we conjugate Ti plus one. So this induces the Hurwitz action on the braid group on L strands, where the Hurwitz moves respect the braid relations. And there are some invariants this Hurwitz action have. The first one is the product. So if we factor all this elements in the first tuple, that product is exactly the same as we get from the second tuple because these two cancel each other out. So then we say a tuple like this is a factorization of the product G. And then for each entry here, we call them factors. And also the Hurwitz action preserves the multi-set of conjugacy classes of the factors and the subgroup generated by the factors. Today, we consider the Hurwitz action when the group is a reflection group. So then in this scenario, all the factors, they are called reflections. So starting with the real case, if we have a real vector space, then the reflection is a linear transformation that fixes a hyperplane. So a group generated by these reflections, they're called the finite real reflection group. One example is the symmetric group. The permutation acts on the space just by permuting the coordinates and every transposition is a reflection. So if the transposition is ij, then it fixes the hyperplane where the two coordinates are the same. And all the irreducibles are already completely classified. Here they are, and they are exactly the finite coxeter groups. If we change the word from real to complex, then we get the definition for complex reflection group. And all the irreducibles are also completely classified by Shepard and Todd in 1955. First, we have GMPN. An element in this group is a n by n monomial matrix. That means in every row and every column, there is exactly one non-zero entry. And that non-zero entry is a mth root of unity. Also, the product of all the non-zero entry is a m over p root of unity. So besides this infinite family of this big infinite family, we also have 34 irreducible ones, 34 exceptional ones, exceptional irreducible ones. And the irreducible real ones are also included in the irreducible complex ones. And now I'll talk a bit more about G and P and when P is one. So this is a bit special because G M one N is the read product of a cyclic group and a symmetric group. And every element in this group is a n by n monomial matrix whose non-zero entry is a nth root of unity. And we can count how many elements there are in this group. So take a permutation matrix, maybe something like that. And for every non-zero entry, now instead of having one, we can have m different choices. So that gives us m. In that permutation matrix, we have exactly n non-zero entry. So that gives us m to the nth possibilities. And there are in total n factorial number of permutations. So that's the size of this group G m one n. And in this group, there are two types of reflection. The first one is this kind, where the underlying permutation is a transposition. And this type of reflection has order two. The other kind is this diagonal one. Depending on what this exponent is, the order of that reflection may be higher than two. Here are the motivating theorems for today's talk. The first one is by Bessis from 2003, which says that for a finite real reflection group, the Hurwitz action is transitive on a special kind of element called the Coxeter element. And then Baumeister, Gobet, Roberts, and Wegner, they show that actually the Hurwitz action is transitive on a bigger collection of elements that is called the parabolic quasi Coxeter elements. So this inspired us to go search for a description of Hurwitz transitive element, but in the compact, complex setting. In order to do that, we need to talk about the minimum length 
right? That's reflection length for any element. There is a formula for that, but in order to do that, we need to introduce some notation and vocabulary. So here we have an element in G615. Instead of writing a matrix every time, we use this bracket notation. So the first part, that's the underlying permutation of this element. This part, these numbers are the exponents of all the non-zero entries. So here we have zero, four, one, one, four, zero, three, one. These are called the weights of the entry. And the total weight is just where we add up all those numbers. So this particular element has weight eight. An element is in group G, M, P, N, if and only if the total weight is a multiple of P. So in this element is in G615 and also G625, but not these two. And then we have this notion of a cycle of an element. That's just a cycle of the permutation. So in this example, we have two cycles, one, two, and three, five, four. In the cycle notation, the weight of the first cycle is five. The weight of the second cycle is three. With that, we can talk about cycle partition. That's just a set partition of the cycles. So we're putting cycles into different parts. The rule is that the each part should have weight a multiple of p. So in this example, if we consider that in G615, we have two different cycle partition where we can put the cycles in the same part or put them in different parts. But if we consider this element in G625, there is only one cycle partition where the two cycles have to be put together. And two more words, the size of a cycle partition is just a number of parts. The value of the cycle partition is the size plus a number of parts of a particular weight, zero mod m. And now we are ready to introduce the reflection length formula by Shi in 2007. So for any element in G and Pn, the reflection length is the minimum of n plus the number of cycles minus the value. So to find the minimum of this whole thing, that's the same as searching for the maximum value. We have an example here. This is a diagonal element in G424. In order to, search, to find its reflection length, we start by collecting all the cycle partitions that follow the rule where each part has weight a multiple of p. Then we compute their value. So the first column is, all, is the size of the corresponding cycle partition. The second volume is the number of parts of weight 0 mod m, and those parts are highlighted here. Here. So we see there are two cycle partitions that have the maximum value, which is four here. So then by the formula, the reflection length of this element is four. And now we are ready to introduce the question we, we set out to answer. Given the element of a finite complex reflection group, what can we say about the Hurwitz orbit structure? And especially when is the Hurwitz action transitive? That means when do we have a single orbit? Here is our answer for any element in G and Pn. The number of orbits is this summation over all the cycle partition that have maximum value. For each cycle partition, we compute this product over the parts of that cycle partition. So for each part, we compute this quantity R of B. That's the GCD of M and the weights of all the cycles in that particular part. Raise that to the power of the size of that part minus one. So going back to our previous example, earlier we have seen there are two cycle partitions that have this maximum value. And applying this formula, we see there is one orbit corresponding to the first cycle partition. There are two orbits corresponding to the second partition. So in total, this particular element has three orbits. And some other operations we can make with this counting formula is that if we want to have one on the left-hand side, that means Hurwitz transitive, then in this summation, we better just have one term. That corresponds to the element having a unique cycle partition with maximum value. And if we want this product to be one, either the exponent is zero, that corresponds to the size of that part equals to one. So this means there is only one cycle in that part, or the base is one which is what we have here. So this is our description of Hurwitz transitive element in G and Pn. And this leads to some special cases. If the element is just a single cycle, then the action is always transitive. And if we are in G M 1n, then the unique cycle partition with maximum value is where every cycle is in its 
individual part. So that corresponds to this part. In order to, to, to avoid having multiple cycles with the maximum value, then we have this condition. And now I will say a little bit about the proof idea. The first step we show is every minimum length factorization belongs to the same orbit as a standard form factorization. So we'll talk about what this means in a minute. This is building on the work by Kluman, Benizak, and Tyker in their work in the symmetric group. So what does a standard form factorization look like? This is one example. This element is in G6 to 10. It has one shortest factorization looking like this. We say this is in standard form because their factorization graph at the bottom looks like that. So what is this look? In every connected component, uh, the graph, it contains some pairs of parallel edges. So in this part, we have one pair. In this part, we have two pairs of parallel edges. And then for every vertex that is in the pair of parallel edges is connected to a path. So if a factorization whose graph looks like this, then we call that this is a standard form. And with this particular standard form, for every pair of parallel edges, we assign a weight to that. With that weight, we can show two standard form factorization are in the same orbit if their weights are the same mod r. If they are not the same mod r, then they are in different orbits because they generate different groups. So then in order to count the total number of orbits, it's enough to just count the number of weights we have mod r. So this is how we come up with our counting formula. For every part in a partition, we just count how many weights there are. For every weight, there are r of b number of possibilities. And in total, there is this many number of weights. So that's raised to this particular power. And every part is independent from the others. So then we multiply that together and do the same for every cycle partition with maximum value. And then this last step also leads to a, another theorem that says for any complex reflection group, the two shortest factorization of an element are in the same orbit if and only if there are two conditions. First, they generate the same subgroup and also they have the same multi-set of conjugacy classes. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much. So let's, uh, let us uh, thank our speaker. And as usual, is there any questions from the audience for our speaker? I have a question. Um, so will you go back to your like last slide? Yeah. Yeah, so you have something about all finite complex reflection groups. How uh, hard would it be to sort of take what, I mean, I know like the definitions you were using were very uh, focused on these, like the GM, PN, but like, is there any way to generalize parts of what you did to, to all complex reflection groups? Yeah, so the proof we have for the G and P and the infinite family that is very specific to those type of family for the infinite. So there, there is also this um, 34 exceptional ones in order to prove this for the exceptional ones, really we are just uh, doing computation brute force. There's no clever tricks there. So then the, the dream is to find a uniform proof that can apply to all complex reflection groups, but so far uh, it's very case specific. Thanks. Yeah, uh, maybe just let me say one more thing. Why we need this other condition. So if we're only talking about GMP and this is enough, but in some of the exceptional ones, there are elements who have two shortest factorization. They generate the same group, but they are in different orbits because they have different multi-set of conjugacy classes. So that's why we add this additional condition to, to apply for all finite complex reflection group. I've got a question um, that may be like a little bit out of left field maybe. What does the, what does the Hurwitz action like mean for a 
for a real reflection group, like for a finite, like for a coxeter group. So the Hermes action is just this move where you, you take a factorization and then you, you sort of move them around, but then maintaining the same orbit. And th this, this is not specific to any type of complex or real. So if we are talking about real, then all those factors, they are just real reflections. If we're talking about complex, then those are just complex reflections. So there's no huge difference there. It's just an okay. operation where you can move around factors. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question for the speaker? All right, let's thank our speaker again for her talk.